Hi, this is Billie Jean King. I'm Mats Villander. This is Mary Carrillo. This is Pam Schreiber. This is Yannick Noah, and you're listening to the Tennis Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Tennis Podcast live from Wimbledon on day seven of Wimbledon. And thank you for anybody watching us live on YouTube right now for bearing with our dress rehearsal that you <laughs> that you witnessed a short while ago. You will never know what gems were said in those, what, three and a half minutes. But that was my best work. We are going to have to do better this time, folks. It, it can't be for nothing. Um, and I think we are going to be able to do better because it has been it has been the most extraordinary day at Wimbledon, hasn't it? I know what we've seen most recently is the match on centre court called off at two sets to love for, for oh, I almost said for Hubert Hercatch then, for Novak Djokovic over Hubert Hercatch. And we will talk about that over the course of the show. But we need to lead with the most extraordinary three hours, I think, of tennis that we as a tennis podcast have collectively witnessed live ever I think I think that's a very good take because uh, you two were both on centre court for Igor Svantec versus Belinda Bencic Igor Svantec was on the brink of defeat there and we we thought we might have created a new curse at some stage because you two were both on I think it was number one court last year wasn't it for for Igor Svantec's loss at Wimbledon to Elise Cornet, we suddenly thought, oh my goodness, when Catherine and David watch Igor Svantec together at Wimbledon, she goes out. But Igor Svantec has, has avoided that curse today. Uh, so that was an amazing match. And simultaneously, I was watching uh, Alina Svitolina versus Victoria Azarenka on, on number one court. I was, I was spiritually with you on, on centre court as well because one of my backhand list players was playing and I always keep an eye on them. I have my laptop with me on number one court. I was watching both and this, this may well be an unpopular opinion. I know that Hannah certainly said earlier that how gutted she was that these two matches were on at the same time. You couldn't, you couldn't give either your, your full attention because you were just being pulled from one to the other. But personally, I, I felt like it elevated the intensity and the drama having them on at the same time. I can just about handle watching two tennis matches at once any more than that and I, I get stressed and as you know. Um, but personally I love these three hours. Best, best day of the tournament so far and all four players were absolutely awesome. I think I agree with you on the them happening at the same time thing. When they both were sort of starting at the same time I was face palming. I was like this is a disaster because I want to watch both these matches I hope that tennis fans everywhere want to watch both these matches and it's simply not possible but I ended up feeling the same I ended up thinking that the domination of these four women of this most incredible most historic of tournaments that these four women just took it over mm. for three hours this afternoon and they would have taken over both BBC One and BBC Two in the UK and I'm sure that the same was the case in other countries as well. I loved the thought of that, David. Yeah, I, and I don't make any apologies for saying that it elevates it in my mind because it was the women that were doing this and it was a bit of a two fingers up to Roland Garros who don't want to put them on in the night session at prime time. Well, they weren't deliberately put at night time in prime time, but that's where exactly they were. And that's where they just captivated anybody who had an interest in tennis for a good couple of hours. Um, and they just showed how great that tennis is. It, was, it had everything to me. It had four women playing just brilliant tennis, the best of their own tennis. I mean, I guess if you're an Igor Svantec fan, you may say, well, her very best tennis would, would win more straightforwardly, but this is grass. And Belinda Bencic was brilliant. To me, it was just a snapshot of what all women, four women do at their best, and they did it for prolonged periods. It was absolutely fantastic. I, I thought it was the best of a, a different kind of Igor Svantec, but we'll come on to, to talk about that in due course. I think we should start, though, with court number one, and Alina Svitolina's deciding set tie-break victory over Victoria Azarenka that David and I watched on my phone, huddled huddled over it together in the press seats on centre court because it finished about 10, 15 minutes after the Svantec-Bencic match did. And 
David and I didn't want to miss two minutes of it, the, the time it would have taken us to get back to, to a screen. So we just stayed there and were utterly engrossed. We're making all sorts of weird noises while the roof was closing on Centre Court. And you texted the group, Matt, on Match Point that you had chills. Mm. And I had FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched one of the most incredible tennis matches of the year and I still had FOMO <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> well I felt like I had FOMO at the start of Svitolina Azarenka because honestly then it did not necessarily feel like the place to be because Belinda Benchik was bringing it against Igor Svantec and Svantec was in such trouble so for the, for the first half of this match I was probably more watching my screen than I was watching the match in front of me um, but what I would say is, is the first half of it felt like a continuation of their matches previously. It was a it was a five and zero head to head lead for Azarenka against Svitolina, and that's enough data to tell you that someone's got a real edge over someone. That there's a bit of a match up or a head to head problem. Particularly as, um, and this was something Nomi Cavaday, the the former British player and now a BBC Radio commentator, pointed out to me earlier. In every single one of those five meetings, Svitolina had been the higher ranked player of the oh, two wow. which really indicates mm. uh, Hammers home that it being a match up issue for yeah. Svitolina yeah that's a very very good point um, and I think also a bit of a mental block issue it felt like because you know she would have chances but just not quite be able to convert them and generally Azarenka was, was pretty comfortable in this match but the one thing that was always there for Svitolina was the crowd behind her and every time there was a flicker that she might come back into it, the crowd were with her. And she plays with such heart and such will. I mean, she always has done, but I think now more than ever. And if ever there was a match to demonstrate that this is a new Alina Svitolina who's, who's come back and that she has changed her game to be more aggressive, it was this one. Because... She, she managed to turn that head-to-head -head around in this match. She started she started hitting, and I sort of made a note of this, massive forehands. And I thought, is that right that I've written massive forehand by Alina Svitolina? Like, she never used to do that. And I genuinely was watching them thinking, no, these, these are genuinely massive forehands that she's hitting. And backhands down the line. And she just got herself back into this match with her own tennis. And... From then, it just became an absolute classic. The third set, Alina Svitolina went ahead, Azarenka got it back, and we ended up in this incredible, incredible match tiebreak. Um, and, yeah, I really, really did have chills at the end because the combination of Svitolina's tennis, and I think it's, I think it's so poignant in a way that Svitolina has come back a different tennis player because she's come back a different person. You know, she... She now is from a country which has been invaded. She knows war now. She knows something about life that other people don't know in a way. And um, she's also a mother. And, and yet her, her desire to play the tennis on her terms and for her career to still be what she wants it to be is just sort of everything. And so I think it's really special that, that she's sort of physically changed as a tennis player because she's changed as a person as well. And that combined with, with the crowd uh, getting behind Alina Svitolina before they did something terrible, which we will come on to, I'm sure. But for that moment on match point, when Alina Svitolina hit that ace, full body chills. It was, it was an astonishing moment. It was, it was the best match I've seen all year since the Australian Open final between Sabalenka and Rabatkina. In, in, in terms of a moment, in terms of an experience in the stadium, it was, it was fantastic. She says it is the best moment of her life, was the best moment of her life, besides giving birth to her daughter Sky in October of last year. And she's had some moments on a tennis court. This isn't the biggest achievement of her career. She's reached Grand Slam semi-finals. That tells you a lot, David, and she told us about it in her press conference. Well, I found that very interesting. I, I've covered Elena Svitolina since the start, really, because her career really taking off coincided with 
BT Sport having the rights to the WTA tour, so I would commentate on her for, for six and a half, seven years. And um, as a tennis player and a human being, she just seems so different to, to, to what I remember back then. And I was really taken, actually. You asked the question, Catherine, why is this such a, an enormous moment to you? Why is it more important to you than any of your other huge victories? This is a woman who's won the WTA finals and, and reached all these huge finals and been top five in the world. Why this one? And she, she was so candid. She was so st straightforward with us and looked, looked you in the eye, looked the cameras in the eye and just said, look, I'm a player from Ukraine and I know what, what's happening in my home country and I just want to do what I can for Ukraine. I want Ukrainian people to feel that this is some sort of victory that, that matters in the grand scheme of things as well, even if it Obviously, you know, there's a, there are bigger elements to, to this war. Of course there are. But that's what she can do. And she wanted to do it. Honestly, she wanted to do it because she was also facing a Belarusian player. And I, I found it an astonishing press conference how candid and clear and detailed and honest she was. And I, I have such respect for her. It was quite interesting that... Azarenka was asked what was different about Svitolina this time compared to the last five times you've played. And she said that it's as though she's freer on the court, which I thought was really interesting because that's, that's kind of the exact opposite of what Svitolina is describing. She's talking about a need to win, a bigger responsibility that she feels to win. And yet it manifests itself in tennis terms as a freedom which I thought was was just such a fascinating point that sort of Azarenka sees it like that down the other end of the court and it feels as though Svitolina is, is freer because she's hitting through her shots and she's playing with all this heart and yet I don't know whether Svitolina would describe it as freedom it's almost it's almost the opposite yeah it, she described it as a responsibility mm. but obviously not a responsibility that she finds burdensome there are plenty of tennis players out there the world number one Igor Svantec that can only focus on themselves it has to be the most individualistic of pursuits in order to achieve success and I understand that this is an incredibly demanding sport but for Svitolina to be unleashed by this responsibility is a very very moving thing um, and what you say Matt about it being so apt that she's a new tennis player as well as a new person. I mean, but before, I was pretty neutral on Lena Svitolina. She seemed like a nice person. She had a nice game. I probably wouldn't have found myself that animated about Alina Svitolina on too many occasions. I am all in mm -hmm. on Alina Svitolina now. She's sort of my number one moving story she makes me feel things as much as anybody else left in this draw possibly more than any of them and that's not just because of the story the the type of tennis she's playing the brand of tennis is stirring david mm. yeah it, it is and it's something we've we've noticed as as her comeback has unfolded that she seems and i said the other day when she beat kenin in the third set she was suddenly knocking her off the court and I'm thinking again this is not the Alina Svitolina I commentated on for six years so at the conclusion of this match when she'd been doing exactly the same thing to go three love up in that deciding set I went and sought out her coach Raymond Slaughter who I've who I knew way back 20 years ago and as a, when he was a player and and um, it's the return of doorstep by david yeah yeah loitering it, it was the players lawn wasn't it Lo oh loitering, loitering on the lawn, lawn with, with law i had to wait 45 minutes before he surfaced um <laughs> but I, it that's was real loitering but it was worth it because and i think that this is one addition we should make to that conversation about the freedom of the hitting where does that come from he his view and he said listen i do not have a magic wand that has made this happen this is not me as a new coach he said he said we started working together for her return there had been discussions a year ago about me being involved he's always gone on well with Gilmore Feast in particular I think he's always gone on well with her but he was working with Talon Greek Sport at the time and he said I don't 
I don't do that. I don't do a bit of this and, and, and that. And when we finished, she was always checking in on me and she wanted me to work with her. So here I am. He said, but this is not like a magic wand that I have just waved and this is happening. He said, when she first started back, I think she played five tournaments and won one match and she was struggling. And he said, when she went to the French Open quarterfinals, he said, I'm not really doing anything different. I'm not really saying anything differently to her and I'm not reacting any differently to her. This is a, a, about an evolution and about a grounding. But in terms of the freedom, the hitting, he said clearly there is a difference. He feels that a lot of that is about her personal life, about her whole world changing. And obviously what's going on in Ukraine is, is a huge part of that. But he said she's really happy in her home life with Gail, with her daughter, and maybe tennis not being the only thing has freed her up a little bit. She still wants to win as much as she ever did. But, and he said, she's always known this. It's not like she knew, she was trying to be a just a counterpuncher and a runner. He said, the problem is that that won her so many matches, but it doesn't win her these matches. Mm. And so she's always known it. She's been told it by other coaches. It's not just Raymond saying it, but now she believes it she feels it and it's happening as a result and i keep coming back to thinking about what she told us in paris when she reached the quarterfinals there which is that they started working together six weeks or maybe two months before her intended comeback when do you ever get that in tennis a six week two month training block let alone with a new coach usually if you've ditched a coach it's like ditching your manager mid-season isn't it it's hmm. you, you're two days on the training pitch and then you're into Saturday 3 p.m and that's that's the way it is with tennis I know I bang on about it but there is so much tennis it is the most outrageous hamster wheel when does anyone ever have time to just reset and start from scratch and say right what kind of tennis player hmm. do I want to be and how can we make this happen and obviously having her daughter is a part of that, but also being a grown up will come on to talk about Denis Shapovalov, I'm sure, over the course of over the course of this podcast and how scrambled his head is about not being willing or not wanting to take the time away from the tour that he so clearly needs because he's just totally lost in that hamster wheel. You know, he said I need to take two months off to rehab my knee. Take two months off then. You're a multimillionaire. Tennis will still be there when you come back. But I I do understand that when you're in the thick of it and the sponsors and prize money and the whole team depending on you, it must be unbelievably hard to have the courage required to, to make that decision. And, and we talk about grown-ups in the room a lot and there is nobody more grown-up and impressive than Alina Svitolina. She's, she's something else. Um... We didn't want to be talking about Ukraine, Belarus stuff pertaining to this match. Uh, but I do think we need to because there was quite a significant moment of the, at the end of it, which is that Victoria Azarenka obviously knew of Elena Svitolina's intention not to shake hands. Svitolina has stated it front and centre. I will not ever be shaking hands uh, with Russian or Belarusian players while... Russia are at war with Ukraine and Victoria Azarenka did exactly what Dario Kazakina did in at the end of their match in Paris which is to preempt that and just go to not wait at the net go to her bag and just give her a wave and say it's fine I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put you in that position and as a result of that Victoria Azarenka is booed off sent a uh, booed off court number one and it was tough scenes Matt it was yeah really tough scenes um as soon as azarenka did that gesture i heard some boos but they were drowned out by the incredible applause that alina svitolina was getting and i i thought oh that's a that's a real shame but hopefully it's not a big moment because most people won't have heard it because the ovation is so big and so deserved for svitolina but then when azarenka left the court just a couple of moments later the beer, uh, the, I almost said the beers, the booze were loud and clear. And honestly, look, I don't really know why people are booing. It's it, it, clearly it's ignorance. I don't, I don't know what they're ignorant, 
ignorant about, but something. But it was it was horrible to witness. It was horrible in pa in, in Paris, where it happened repeatedly, and it was horrible today. Um, Azarenka did not deserve that. The match did not deserve that. Um, and I think again, going back to Alina Svitolina, being <laughs> being a grown up and being someone who we need to be listening to, she said it in Paris. Tennis in somehow whether that's the tours or whether it's the slams need to make it clear to people that a handshake is not going to happen between a russian or a belarusian and a ukrainian player whether it's an announcement before the match or whether it's uh some sort of um yes some kind of announcement some way because people are not necessarily across press conferences and they don't necessarily know what alina svitolina is saying i would i would like more people to know things and I would like them to maybe just be able to work it out for themselves but clearly that isn't going to happen so it needs to be this is a big issue now it's happened at successive slams we need to stop it happening it's happened to Svitolina she her French yeah. Open ended being booed off court and that was something she kind of um, pointed out a lot in her press conference I think she she didn't want to see Azarenka be booed today but she equally didn't want that press conference to be about Azarenka and a Belarusian player being booed. She didn't want Azarenka to be painted as the victim, and Azarenka didn't want to be painted into the corner of of holding herself up, up as a victim. She she clearly felt it was unfair, and that's a horrible way for her tournament to end after giving what she gave to that match and and that crowd. It's such a terrible shame. Um, but these are deeply imperfect times we are living in. I'm so happy though that we get to see Alina Svitolina play tennis again in two days time over Iga Svantec. Her hopes of, well, she had, she told us after her last victory that her hopes for this tournament were evidently so ho low that she had tickets to see Harry Styles in Vienna <laughs> a couple of nights ago. This is like when, who, was it Dominika Sabulkova? that had booked her wedding during yes. Wimbledon. Yes. And then accidentally reached the semi-finals <laughs> and had to postpone the wedding. That's right. I mean, Harry Styles is a bigger deal than a wedding. <laughs> um, but Harry Styles has offered her tickets at a later date on Instagram. Because he's a classy guy like that. We love oh, that. We love great. that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. He likes his tennis, Harry. Maybe I'll listen to his music. He's, he's quite good, I think. Yes. I don't <laughs> think I'm allowed to say the name, but I do know someone that has played tennis with him. I know a former tennis player, big in these parts, that has played tennis with Harry Styles and says he's very good. Mm. Okay. Who, who can who can say who can say who it was? And and we just went a whole segment about tennis players and concerts without mentioning Casper Ruud. I've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, should we talk about Iga Swiatek instead? Who will yes. be Alina Svitolina's quarterfinal opponent, having saved two match points at five six in the second set today to come back and beat Belinda Bencic 6-7, 7-6, 6 in three hours and three minutes to reach a first Wimbledon quarterfinal. I think that's the, well, actually, I don't know why I'm saying that like it's a bold statement. She's never reached a Wimbledon quarterfinal before. That's her biggest win at Wimbledon ever, yeah. David. And, and it had all the things that you all have said for months that you want to see from her. And so it feels actually bigger than just going and blasting her off the court dug in, showed how much appetite she's got, wants it, found solutions, playing a player who was just playing out of her mind. I mean, what a sight Belinda Bencic is when she's in full flow. Because Sviantek was hitting the ball so hard and so ferociously and the feet were going a million miles an hour and yet Bencic is still taking the ball early, half volley in it, using the backhand and, and I, was, I was thinking, I don't I don't feel worthy of watching these <laughs> backhands without Matt here. I, d I had a bit of imposter syndrome as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. But um, David and I were making noises at the backhands and then thinking, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> and, then, and then because I was watching in the stream that was behind, getting messages from me mm. like two minutes later, did you see that backhand? And you yes, were like, we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Several points have passed. But the, the thing is that because we've 
we've had this conversation about Iga Swiatek as to where Wimbledon sits in her list of priorities, given that she's such a dominant clay court player and she wants to win the French Open. Where, how much does she really want to dig in when the chips are down? Obviously, there's a preparation element to it all as well that she's not playing many matches before the tournament starts. I just think she showed how much appetite she's got today, because she was stressed you 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 noticed it on the tv screen didn't you from court one which is the one thing you can't see from center court when you're in the press seats you can see so much you can hear so much but you can't see the facial expressions mm. and and i always think a stressed Iga Swiatek, having seen her lose to elisa corne last year is a concern but she found the f solutions yeah i thought she looked really stressed at the end of that first set because i think I think she should have won that first set. I, th I think you could arguably say that Svantec won the first set that, um, sorry, Bengtschik won the first set that Svantec should have won, and Svantec won the hmm. second set that yes. Bengtschik should have won. It was it was one of those matches, um, and yeah, I, I did think she was really really stressed in this match. Um, I felt like she just she just found a way to hit through it though, and I think. You know, in a w last year she tried to hit through stress and it came out as unforced errors. And this year she seems to have found a way to hit through stress and it come out as winners. I mean, we saw it in the in the French Open final when she was pushed against uh, Mukova, the way her forehand suddenly took over the match. And it, it did again today. I mean, as much as I was ascending to a different plane of existence at the Belinda Bencic backhands and sort of <laughs> floating after they were hit and struck so purely, <laughs> the Igor Svantec forehand ended up being kind of kind of the difference maker, and it, I, I, I think it's I think it's probably the best shot in the world. Um, and yeah, I love seeing Igor Svantec in in that mode. Uh, and I think we've learned a lot about Igor Svantec at the French Open, doing that against Mukova, and again today against Belinda Bencic. It's 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 great to see. There was some stat going around that she'd never played a match with with two tie breaks in even mm. you know which which just goes to show how so often her matches are one-sided either way as we talk about she either wins very easily or quite a lot of the time she might lose in straight sets and it not be particularly close either so i just love to see it as a stat that Iga Svantec herself threw around in her post-match interview was i think that's the first time i've ever saved match points and gone on to win right i've not been able to verify that stat in the short amount of time that we've had but <laughs> let's Let's trust Iga Svantec on that, shall we? Yeah, no, interesting. Interesting. Mm. Which all points to what we're saying about her winning close matches. It just if That was the thing. Like We've seen Iga Svantec play for years, but it felt, it felt new what we saw today, her having to do that on centre court at Wimbledon. We haven't seen that before. Yeah, I think it's really big for her in the context of this tournament. David, that is, that's the most I've ever enjoyed watching Belinda Bencic. I so enjoyed it today. I've sometimes found her trickier to get my teeth into because of the lack of seeming intensity sometimes. You know I love, you know I love a bent over fist pump. <laughs> and she's just not that, not that kind of gal most of the time, is she? But I loved her today the the stroke production the softness of her stroke production and the the inside out backhand which is my favorite shot in tennis other than sort of funny troll shots like a a drop shot return or yeah <laughs> something in that genre of the sort of standard selection of tennis shots and into out backhand is is what gets my heart going and benchich is is such a delight it's, it's as good as any in the sport that one because you stand in the center of the court and you've got Iga Svantec smacking the biggest shot she can at you and she just sort of leans out of the way of it and just hits it off into the left hand corner <laughs> into the postage stamp and she did that twice and made me swear <laughs> <laughs> in the canteen she's got that trampoline effect that you yes. talk about of where's this power coming no. from I know she's not a power player just but proper timing yeah, um, it's lovely. So, no, she's a glorious player to watch in full flight. I wonder whether, I wonder whether we'll ever feel as though she's reached her potential with that game. I, I'm not convinced we will. I hope we do. I hope that means because, to, to be honest, to reach her potential would be 
to go and beat Igor Sviantec today or one of the, the what we're calling the big three now and go and win one of these titles because the talent is there. I often I said to Catherine after through that match, you know, Matt often talks about, yeah, but that serve is so attackable. And, and that's the thing that, that you you look out for. And this is the the, the one final thing I'd, I'd want to say is that when Sviantec is match points down, and there's, there were two in a row, I think mm-hmm. it was 15-40, mm. she hit two clean winners. Yeah. and Love that. And Benjic said, said that she had no regrets about those no, those match shouldn't. points. You know, she wouldn't have done anything differently. Igor Sviantec just ripped them from her. Brilliant, brilliant tennis. They were tennis. astonishing points. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I do think Benchik's serve is a bit of a weakness. Like Hannah actually asked us, why is Fiontech having so much trouble seemingly with the Benchik serve? Because I think I think that is genuinely see, generally seen as something that you can get at and attack. My sort of take on that was I do think on on grass the Benchik serve is maybe a little bit more effective because she's only she's only really got a slice serve. It doesn't she doesn't have a kick serve really it's a, it's a slice and it skids it stays quite low and i do think a further development than Sviantec can make on on grass is to develop some kind of block or chip return she she goes for it on return which is great but it does quite often result in a lot of misses and i think she was great once the rallies were starting she was she was playing really well today but there's quite a lot of occasions where she just didn't really get the rally started because she maybe went for it when when she wasn't quite in position or the ball wasn't quite there and a, and a lot of the time that was that was on return but um yeah Benchich's his game is is great and and I've seen that intensity and that sort of Benchich getting her teeth into a match in Billie Jean King Cup a lot that's the best version of Benchich that I've seen and she she set out to win that competition and delivered for Switzerland and I've never really seen it transfer to the slam so much. But I but I think we saw it today. She just she just came up against the best player in the world, coming up with her best tennis at the crucial moments. She was one point away from beating the dominant world number one, and that's having played so little tennis and pretty much zero fit tennis since since the start of the spring, really. I mean, she had a bunch of strapping on her shoulder today. When when she walked out, lost the opening game on Shontek serve and then went love 40 down on her own serve, I had that sinking feeling of, oh, no. I, th- I thought, she, she she's, she's clearly not fit. She doesn't look like she can serve. This is going to be awkward. So delighted to be wrong. So I really hope that once the disappointment fades, Bencic can, I know it's a cliche, but take the positives and build on this because... She's she's not very good at gaining momentum as a tennis player, is she? She just kind of pops up and does a thing and mm. looks brilliant and then pops back down again. So please pop up and stay up, Belinda. I would. <laughs> now I'm on board the Belinda Bencic <laughs> hype train, mm, finally. Join us. Yeah, I need her to, to hang around. Um, so it is Bencic against... No, 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 no. It is Svitolina. <laughs> against Sviantec in the quarterfinals. The other quarterfinal that was set up today is Jessica Pagula against Marketa Vondrosheva, and that's because Vondrosheva won the checkoff, which is a term that, to my delight, has really taken off. <laughs> <laughs> I really made that happen, and I'm very proud. 6-3 <laughs> in the third over Marie Buzkova. And this was the first match of the day. It was the only singles match of the day happening at 11 a.m., wasn't it? And I'm so glad that it was scheduled where it was in the end because I'm sure it would have got lost had it been scheduled later in the day when other stuff was happening just because the names involved aren't as eye-catching as a lot of the others on the schedule today. And I get that this being a brilliant match is a real, like, niche tennis vibe, isn't it? But... I'm going to assume that a lot of people listening and watching right now are niche tennis kind of people. So let's talk about this match because it was fabulous. I can do niche tennis. <laughs> That's fine. That's why I've come to you. Yeah. Uh, it was a fantastic contrast, which is what I really liked about it, because you've got Von Drosheva, who's so languid and makes the game look so easy. And then Buzkova is is quite effortful and has has quite sort of awkward stroke production you know it's also a lefty versus a righty um you know what you're going to get from 
boost cover. She's pretty dependable. She's pretty reliable. You've got no idea what's coming from Marketa von Drosche, but So it just, it had contrast at the heart of it, this match, which I think was what I loved. Buskova took the first set, was was leading, and and her defence was clearly maddening for Vondrosheva because some of the rallies were just so long and Buskova was just always there, always able to get the ball back. She's a real athlete, isn't she, Buskova? Fantastic, yeah. And, and, and so dogged in, in her determination to sort of reach every ball and put it back in the most awkward awkward place possible and then she can you know she can attack and and hit plenty of winners herself as well but as it went on von Drosheva started to sort of pick her apart a bit and started to un- unlock the defenses and she's got so many ways that she can hurt you von Drosheva, with angles or suddenly going down the line she's she's a great watch as we know um she can also be a terrible watch <laughs> i mean i still haven't forgiven her for roland garros when i picked her to be uh, what reached the final i think and then we went and saw her play casakina and she was yeah terrible she's yeah. an inexplicable tennis yeah. player well she seems to be having sort of amazing results every couple of years it was the french open final in 2019 then she got the silver medal at the Olympics in, in 2021, and now she's reached her first Grand Slam quarterfinal since that French Open run here at Wimbledon, two years on. So, see you in 2025, Marquetta. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're going to see her again on, on That's Tuesday. True. That's true, yeah. When she Once takes... this run is over. <laughs> Once she's won Wimbledon. Once she's well, won Wimbledon, we'll when, see w- Will this run be over on Tuesday? She takes on Jessica Bagula who's made such serene progress through this tournament. And I don't know what to make of it. Is it one of those, she looks brilliant because, no offence, you know, she's not played any top players and as soon as she she does, she's going to be exposed? Or is she just sneaking her way through under the radar, keeping lots in the tank, ready to pounce? David, you commentated on this. Yeah, I did. And... It's hard to believe it was the same sport that we witnessed later in the afternoon with the three hours that we've been describing because this was a really uneventful match. It was over in an hour against Lesia Sorenko, who's just not a good matchup against Jessica Pagula. I think it does show how far Pagula has come because they played each other once before in 2019 and Sorenko won it 6-4 in the third. Um, and it's hard to fathom how that could have, could be the case given what I witnessed this afternoon. But Jessica Pagula was outside the... Well, she was 100 in the world or something like that in 2019. That's how far she's come. So she's, recently. Yeah, I mean, mm. she, and she was mid-20s at that point, age-wise. She's 29 now. Um, but her big flat hit, and actually maybe more than that, what what's so impressive about her is her retrieving skills. Do you remember that match we watched with her and Petra Kvitova at, the, at Indian Wells? Mm. When... Ooh. when she just kept on running balls down and you're like how are you getting to these <laughs> balls and manipulating them back with little chip forehands and so forth she's really good at that and i think she's maybe just figured something out on grass she had never gone to the fourth round before and now she's in the quarterfinals which completes her set i think she is playing really well she's won the last three matches barely losing a handful of games in each one she did have a really tough first round against lauren davis where she nearly went out actually but now she's played her way in she looks good um i still think she's below the big three i think she's below on super in terms of where i would categorize her form uh, and on this surface but she certainly looks good and given that she's playing vondrosova who you just don't know what you're going to get you would you would probably back at a win. Yeah, I think we find out everything in that quarterfinal because, as you said, she's never been beyond the quarterfinal at a slam. She's had she's had five of them, three of those losses to either Sviontek or Barty. So, you know, she would ne- not have been expected to win those matches. She played Jennifer Brady in her first Grand Slam quarterfinal, which you know, again, she won a set. It was her first quarterfinal. Didn't feel like a bad loss. Brady went on to make the final. She played Azarenka this year that in was Australia, a and that I thought she let herself down with that performance, mm. especially in the second set. There was there was no resistance there at all. She was really flat on the day and and didn't play well. She's going to need to bring it against Vondrosheva because 
she doesn't want to end up in the in a she could she get von Drosevich, couldn't she? Yeah, she, she could have a really not fun time right. in that she, match. <laughs> she, she needs to find a way to play that match on her terms rather than mm. get stuck in, in the web of von Drosevich. Suck for the opponent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw a lot of... Tell me if I'm s- stretching stretching an illustration here too far, but this match between Pagula and Serenko was happening on court one at the same time that Rublev was playing on centre court and eventually winning in five sets over Alexander Bublik. And I see so many parallels between Pagula and Rublev. Obviously today, they both completed their Grand Slam quarterfinal set. For both of them, Wimbledon was the only one missing. For Pagula, it was on the sixth attempt. For Rublev, uh, sorry, for Rublev, uh, for Pagula, it's the sixth Grand Slam quarterfinal. For for Rublev, it's the seventh. Neither of them have ever won a Grand Slam quarterfinal in all those that they've played, and they are extremely good tennis players with so much to admire. But they have ceilings. Now, ceilings can be pushed up which is where that analogy fails because the whole, <laughs> the whole point of a ceiling is that it can't be. Think of it as a sort of canopy. <laughs> um, we've seen players raise their ceiling yeah. before. It can happen, but they do have ceilings at the moment, these two. I think it's a fair analogy. Uh, I think personally that Pagula is maybe relatively the better player. Um, she's got wins. She's got a win over Svantec earlier this year, I think, mm-hmm. w- when it was particularly to her liking the conditions. But then I always do this with Andre Rublev, don't I? <laughs> I always <laughs> say he's not as good as what people say he is, and, and here he is again. Um, so maybe I'm the one who's been unfair. I, I think it's a fair analogy, and I think Svitolina is, is is an example of how you can raise your your ceiling. Because I didn't think she'd got this sort of tennis in her. I thought she'd got winning tennis, but I didn't think she would win like she's winning. I thought she'd need to rely on somebody else. Um, so I, I think, and I think Pagula is a better player than maybe I realise she is. Um, the, the loss she had in in Australia was was a tough one against Azarenka, but I am mindful that she's she was really struggling with with trying to work out whether to tell the world about her mum's cardiac arrest which she eventually did a few just literally a couple of weeks after the Australian Open in that incredible article she wrote in Players Tribune um, and reading that again reminded me of just just psychologically mentally how hard that uh, that was for her um, but here she is looking a little bit like Svitolina free out there on grass maybe not realising that not expecting this much from herself and sort of just figuring it out I think. Rublev Matt figuring it out you watched the fifth set here and saw possibly the shot of the tournament? I think certainly the best shot I've seen so far the best moment in a match Mm. I would say Um, I felt kind of bad because I did the exact same thing at Roland Garros I went out to watch Andre Rublev in a fifth set after he'd been two sets up and of course, he lost at Roland Garros to Sonigo in this incredible atmosphere with sort of most of the stadium seemingly pulling for Sonigo. And then I go out there today and I'm, you know, it's, it's the same situation. Is Andre Rublev going to lose from two sets up in successive slams? And kind of all throughout the match, I felt a bit sorry for Andre Rublev because he was sort of, he was dragged into the sort of tennis match that he doesn't want to play. I, 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 I always think of, your tales, Catherine, about uh, incompatible holiday partners. And I felt like they were incompatible tennis players. <laughs> Andre Rublev wants everything to be ordered. And he wants there to be rhythm. He wants there to be a pattern of play. Rublev is the guy that wants to do activities. And he wants to know what they are ahead Ru- of time. Rublev is, right. the, is the organised fun guy. Yeah. yeah. Excursions. Let's go, let's go on a group kayak tour. Whereas yeah. Bublik just suddenly decides he wants to do something else. And, an yeah. and, and Rublev cannot handle that if you're going off schedule. Hey, let's just go to the bar and hang out and see what happens. Let's yeah. see where the night takes he, us. Who yeah. knows where it will go? Yeah. <laughs> Rublev is not about <laughs> drop shot returns or <laughs> standing on the service line to return the serve or 135 mile an hour serves down match point, which was what... I think it was a second serve, 135 mile an hour second serve down match point, which is what Bublik did 
in that fourth set. It was it was just it was just a nightmare for Rublev. And yet I was so impressed that amid all of that, he stayed pretty level headed and, and pretty calm and there was there was less of the self-criticism that we so often see in Rublev matches. He, yeah, you'd have been proud of him today, David. He, 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 well, I, it's just, I mean, it doesn't matter what I think, but I don't mind watching him in the way that I used to. I don't get that knot in my stomach of, of especially when my kids are watching, seeing what he's going to do to himself on the court. I d- he doesn't seem to do that as much now. And, and I mean, it's no coincidence, is it, that he's having better results? He's a, He seems just happier yes I mean he sort of told himself you know okay I'm in a fifth set but I've had chances here I just need to I just need to stay in this match and I'll get another chance and he was right and and that incredible moment that you mentioned was was right towards the end of the match a a really incredible rally broke out between them Rublev hit his forehand into Bublik's backhand corner and Bublik hit this incredible backhand down the line which he thought was a winner everyone in the crowd thought was a winner he punctuated it with this extended grunt that was me too the absolute favorite it was it was a grunt that he was ready to turn into a celebration and then from out of nowhere as john McEnroe would say where did he come from (laughs) andre rublev just appeared and somehow had had, had made up the ground and sort of hit a diving squash shot winner and john McEnroe thinks everything's out of nowhere nowhere. this was actually out of nowhere this was actually out of nowhere yeah (laughs) it was and public's face just just said it all he He was just in shock and there's this amazing uh there's this amazing video of of the point where this where his public fan clearly gets up and punches the air as he as he sees it and then promptly sits back down because he realizes that Rublev's got the full back and hit it for a winner. It was absolute madness. It was one of those it was one of those tennis points that has gone you know absolutely viral. I, th- I feel like everyone has seen it and that doesn't actually happen that often. It seems to happen all the time when Carlos Alcaraz is playing. It <laughs> doesn't happen that often to Andre Rublev. Especially not to Andre, Andre Rublev. Yeah, I'm pleased for him. Um, his run is going to end, though, because he's almost certainly <laughs> going to face Novak Djokovic in the next round. And I have such mixed, confused feelings about Rublev winning today because I love the guy. I really do. He is good people, Andre Rublev. And I'm, I, I, I don't feel quite as strongly about it as you, David, but I don't like to see the guy harming himself on on the court as he sometimes does but um i'm i'm a i'd love his forehand i'd I'd love to see a bit more variety in his game but i I like his game and i'm a big fan of him and i wish him well i don't ever want him to to see him play grand slam quarterfinals against novak djokovic because they are duds at a grand in by the time you get to a quarterfinal there should be some sense of jeopardy and anticipation ahead of every match you know you need to even if there's a heavy favorite you need to feel some sense of oh but what if that happens or what if you know what what tactics are you going to adopt and I just don't feel any of that about Rublev against Djokovic yeah I think it's fair I, I I go into those matches thinking that unless Novak Djokovic gets ill injured or just has the most terrible day <laughs> Rublev can't win and, I, and, if, and if the problem pro- is Rublev goes into those matches feeling the same. Yeah. If Rublev proves me wrong and plays lights out tennis and beats Novak Djokovic with Novak Djokovic not ill, injured or terribly out of form, I will look everybody in the eye and tell them I was wrong. I'm quite happy to do that. But I just don't see it. There's no evidence to suggest that's going to happen. He's a really, really good player. He gives everything. There's no stone he leaves unturned. He's just not as good as the guy. And and what makes it worse is he thoroughly believes he's not as good as the guy. <laughs> and and yeah. I bless him for it. You know, I he's know. A, it, it's it's admirable in a way because he's honest. It's just that <coughs> when you're watching a sporting contest, as you say, you want jeopardy. It's that line between delusion and self belief and how fuzzy it is. I'm fascinated by it in sports people. Um, and I, it's not, it's not scientific, but 
Rublev is definitely on the wrong side of it. Um, I, I say Djokovic. I probably should add, for the record, just in case, the words or Hubert Hercatch. <laughs> Although I don't think they'll be required. As it stands, Djokovic is two sets to love up on Hubert Hercatch. They will have to come back tomorrow to complete that match. Uh, I haven't double checked the order of play, but I expect it to be in slotted in. Yes, it has been slotted in second on centre court after a one thirty start. Just just quickly to recap those two sets. It was classic, wasn't it? Hercatch has has the tennis to be a threat to Novak Djokovic. He he doesn't have the fang. I mean, look, he, he, he showed the serving that I saw a couple of days ago against Lorenzo Massetti and then, then then some because he was holding serve pretty much easily most of the time because he was putting so many great serves down, playing well. He got up 6-3 in that first set tie break. It's a cho- he choked it. Massive he? Not, choke. You can't lose that from there. Look, it is Novak Djokovic. He has this aura. He's incredible in tie breaks. Her catch fell apart, mm. and then when, and and he didn't win another point. I don't think um, Djokovic didn't have to do m- that much. He choked. We got into the second set. I think it was admirable from Herkash that he actually got it to a tie break, having w- withstood what had just happened. I, I would have gone to pieces. I'd have lost love and love. I mean, aside from the fact that I'm rubbish at tennis, just mentally I couldn't have coped with that. I think a lot of players couldn't, so fair play, he gets himself to another tie break. Gives himself the opportunity to fall apart again. <laughs> he gets up a mini break and 5 4. And we were stood next to each other watching the TV in the media centre. And I said, Can you see this happening? I can't. And sure enough, he, he fell apart again. And, and there is an element, absolutely an element of Djokovic causing it because he asks the questions that need to be asked and you have to show you've got the answers and he doesn't uh, or certainly he didn't maybe Look, tomorrow he'll come he back might and he'll tomorrow turn david you know, <laughs> i tell you what he, what he does have he has the same game that the players that have caused djokovic problems here a couple of times have got kevin anderson sam, sam query. query huge serve weapons off the ground clear about how they have to go about it but you've got to win those couple of points that really matter if you, wa- if you want to knock him out. Got to have a bit of fang. Um, yeah. yeah, we do. Look, <laughs> of course we expect oh, Novak Djokovic to come back and complete that victory. We we and Novak Djokovic and probably Hubert Hercatch would rather that match didn't have to come back tomorrow. This is something that's happened a few times. Matches going late. We keep doing this podcast at 11pm or gone 11 p.m. don't we and that's because it's because of the scheduling on on centre court it starts at 1 30 every day which is a new thing since 2021 it's actually a, a kind of it it came in because of the pandemic didn't it um or certainly post pandemic i don't know if it was a direct result of of the pandemic and there is a lot of call for that to be moved back in order to prevent this happening yeah it's a problem to be honest, because I don't think any of us have a problem with the curfew. You know, we've been pretty outspoken on the fact that tennis should should not be happening uh, in in the early hours, as it, as it so often does everywhere else. Uh, I think, you know, ideally, in an ideal world, I would probably push it back to midnight. But you know, it's the it's the Merton Council here. They they dictate the rules and it's and it's 11 p.m. so you've got to work with that and tennis matches are longer than they used to be and <laughs> nothing extraordinary happened today on centre court and yet we didn't finish the day's play and that is pretty unsatisfactory i mean yes there were five set men's match and yes it was a three set women's match but you know, it was Alexander Bubli. He does not play long matches. He's very quick between points. It, it, it was it was a sort of it, it was a quick fire five setter, if that's possible, and then it was a fairly standard women's three set match. And the only way that they were going to finish is if Novak Djokovic absolutely sort of raced through that match, which, as, as David said, because of how Hubert Hercatch was serving, that was that was very unlikely. So it's a and it's happened repeatedly at this tournament, and it's it's a problem because yeah it, it it's not good for the ticket holders it's n- not good for oh, 
It's a bug situation. <laughs> Thank you very much for saving me. Um, and look, I, I think they need to look into this for, for next year because um, even an hour's, an hour's extra time, mm. you know, if they start at 12.30 rather than 1.30, I think that would make, that would all, make the difference. all the difference. Uh, Sally Bolton is uh, speaking to the press tomorrow, so I'm sure there'll be some, some updates. Um, I'm a big fan of the staggered starts, actually, and I like the main show court starting later than the outside courts. I'm a fan of all of that in principle. I just think, yeah, moving it back half an hour, an hour would be a great thing. I'm quite sure there are myriad reasons that we as non-tournament directors can't possibly understand. Um, but just, yeah, it, it's, yeah. I, I'm sure it will be considered. I mean, I think that the, their view is they want to absolutely avoid the early hours thing and they have to anyway because of the Merton Council they want a full a full arena they want the stadium full when the players come out so they don't want it to be over I think honestly they want it don't want it to be over lunchtime because then you may get a French Open situation in a half empty stadium they don't want that I get that but it used to be right I mean as we said, the one thirty start is something that's come in yeah, listen, later. I, used, I, I, I think, think it used to be 12.30, they've didn't got it? A, well, I'll tell you, go back. It used to be 2 p.m. Right. Right? <laughs> but matches were How shorter, back? as you say. Is this the um, 90s? Yeah. Matches were shorter, and there was no roof. There, wasn't, there were no lights. It just didn't go on as long as yeah. this. But, look, I think, as well, 12.30, I think, is a sensible idea. I also think they need to cut down on this time in between matches, which they do. You know, when it gets tight, they take them down to 10 minutes rather than the half an hour. I don't really understand the half an hour, personally. I, I, look, I'm, I'm sure there's, there, there's value in them going late into the night for TV ratings and all that sort of thing. I get it. But this is unideal to have matches going over two sets to love or one set all, and, and there's a, there's a, there is a kind of fairness issue too for, mm. for, the, for the player mm. who then has less time to recover or, or has to come back each day. And that is part of the sport, I get it. But I do think that there is a change there that could be made and would work. Mm. Yeah. Future. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be looked at. We'll um, we'll keep across it. Uh, so Djokovic brackets possibly Hubert Hercatch to face <laughs> Rublev in the quarterfinals. The other quarterfinal will be Grigor Dimitrov, who came back and finished the job without blinking against Francis Tiafoe today. That was held held over overnight. Yeah, but uh, that's the other side of the draw, right? Oh, hang he on, what plays, have I done? Uh, so he plays, oh, he plays Holger Rune. It's been mm. a long day, folks. And <laughs> all I've this rain. It, I've got it written in it's, front of me. It's, it's Sinisafulin, isn't it's it? It's Sinisafulin. We why need we to talk do, about that. Why are we doing live shows? <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about Roman Sifulin? <laughs> no. Let's, we do need to talk about Grigor Dimitrov. Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps actually we need to talk about Francis Tiafo. And what I... I was convinced he would win a set today at least. I was convinced he would turn this into a match mm. and ask the mental question of Grigor Dimitrov. And he didn't. Mm. It was over in a flash. I mean, Dimitrov picked up where he left off, playing brilliantly, to be honest. Uh, playing just like we saw him in practice about a, about 10 days ago that we that we mentioned on the podcast. You know, he, he's, he is playing very, very well and mm. playing very good, good grass court tennis. I think he was really using his slice if extremely effectively in this match and Francis Tiafa could not really handle it. But unless Grigor gets another really big win, it does to me feel like the story of this match is Tiafo because, you know, we've talked about the, the sort of change that there's been in Francis Tiafo since that US Open. And he's talked about that himself, how much he's motivated, particularly at Wimbledon and the US Open, and how much he thinks his game stacks up on grass. And he said today, I'm a top 10 player in the world and I played like I didn't have an ATP point. He was absolutely furious. He called it horrible, depressing, horrendous, terrible. Um, he said he's never felt like this after a loss. He was absolutely gutted about what happened. I mean, at a complete loss to explain it, 
um, I got sent some audio by Matt Futterman, who had been part of a sort of small group of journalists who'd who'd spoken to to Francis Tiafoe. He hadn't done a, a sort of main press conference, and uh, Matt Futterman actually asked the question: Are you feeling sort of any any kind of extra pressure, you know, from the outside, you know, as a result of your new status and as as a result of you know even just being on Netflix? You know, it's a you know it's maybe a lot to deal with, and he said no absolutely not I want to win a Grand Slam for me like, I really don't he said I, I don't care about the media I don't care about anyone else or anyone's expectation of me I want to win it for me and you know <laughs> he was really really hurt by this and by his performance because <laughs> and also by his performance in slams generally this year you know because he mm. he, he, he mentioned he should have taken, uh, if we remember all the way back to the Australian Open, he blew a 6-1 lead in a tie break to, to Hatchinov to lose that match. At Roland Garros, he served for the fourth set, I think, against Zverev and, and lost that match in the fourth set. And he just simply didn't show up against uh, Dimitrov. He was, he was the harshest critic of, of himself in that match. You know, he doesn't need anyone to tell him. He knows that he played badly. He just needs to figure out why it happened and, and, and why it happened two days in a row. Because, mm. you know, there was this break in this match. There was a chance to put it right today. And he was he was just as bad today as he as he had been the day before. Yeah. Tough, really tough scenes for him. Yeah. And a big time of year coming up mm. with the uh, the U.S. hard court swing. So, um, as discussed, Dimitrov through <laughs> <laughs> to face Olga Rina. That match will be tomorrow. We'll have a quick look ahead to tomorrow's order of play in a moment. Um, the other quarterfinal set up today was Yannick Sinner, who toiled for a couple of sets against Daniel Galan uh, before winning in three straight sets. It's been an easy draw for Yannick Sinner to get to this point. You can only beat who's in front of you. I just don't feel like we really know yet where Yannick Sinner is at. Can I do a newsletter tease? Sure. Oh, yeah. Mm. More on just how easy that draw has been oh. in the newsletter. Okay. Once I've... Worked well, it out. <laughs> on paper, it remains easy in the next round when he faces Roman Sifulin, who beat Denis Shapovalov today in four sets. Sifulin is a complicated one. He was a great junior, a junior Grand Slam champion in 2015. He was the fourth Beatle of the the Russian junior, the promising Russian juniors, Hashinov, Medvedev, Rublev. Sifulin was right there with them. They were a gang of four. He was every bit of tal- a bit as talented and he was a bit of a later bloomer. And then I think when he was about to bloom, a, a global pandemic happened. He didn't make his tour debut, um, his Grand Slam debut until the Australian Open 2021. These, this is still the infancy of Roman Sifulin's career. So we might be looking back in five years time with him constantly reaching Grand Slam quarterfinals thinking, well, that wasn't an easy draw at all. But right now, with a career high ranking of 82 in the world, it looks like a great draw, doesn't it? So Fulin benefited from uh, a depleted Denis Shapovalov. He's carrying a knee injury that he told us in press afterwards needs a minimum of two months to rehab, quite possibly significantly lo- longer. It, m- it might need surgery. He doesn't know. And he's in this scrambled headspace of being afraid to get off the hamster wheel to do what needs to be done. And it's it's a bit scary, really, hearing a professional tennis player talk like that, especially given that it's not an isolated case. Sitsipas was doing that earlier in the year, wasn't he, with his... Felix Ogier C mm. feels a bit like he's mm. doing that too. I don't know how severe his problem is, but I... I I don't like it at all. I mean, sorry, you're going nowhere at the moment. And so sort this out. I hope he does. I really hope he does. But he said, look, the US Open is really important to me. If I skip two months now, that means missing that part of the season. But surely you want to be a threat at the US Open. You don't just want to make up the numbers. Dispiriting Mm. defeat. He he needs... He needs good people around him, mm. I think, to be able to help him help him and give him that advice. And some clarity. Yeah. He seemed really scrambled and I um I wish him well. 
as discussed, the order of play for tomorrow looks thus. Centre court starts 1.30. Beatrice Haddad Meyer against Elena Rabatkina. Then the resumption of Novak Djokovic against Hubert Hurkacz, the big comeback. Then Ange Jabeur. Imagine if that is a comeback. Oh, I'm going to look It'd so be silly. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Uh, Ange Jabeur against Petra Kvitova is third up. And then Alcaraz against Berrettini. The tennis gods mm. slash the executive producers have smiled upon David Law and put him on that match. Yes. Yeah, or the first two sets of it before the curfew anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, it only needs three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice court number one is where you'll find Daniel Medvedev against Yuri Lehechka Al- uh, Ekaterina Alexandra against Arena Sabalenka and the match that I definitely knew was happening between Grigor Dimitrov and Holger Rune and last mentioned today because uh Court number two is where you'll find Chris Eubanks and Stefano Sitsipas, their second on, and it's where you'll find Madison Keys against Mira Andreva. Mm. 16-year-old Andreva having beaten Anastasia Potapova today to reach round 16 of Wimbledon on her debut. She's qualified here. She's only ever played three WTA main draw events, Madrid, Roland Garros, and here. She only does the big ones. <laughs> I uh, I like how she rolls. <laughs> and she's only ever played six matches on grass and she's <laughs> won them all. Three in qualifying and, and, and three in the main draw. And this was this was another fantastic match. It was obviously meant to be played yesterday, carried over to today. First set, not really a contest. Andreva all over Potapova. But what impressed me so much is we watched Andreva <laughs> really not compete very well against Coco Goff in sets two and three just a month ago at Roland Garros. And she said after that match, she gave herself a big talking to about her attitude on the court and the way she approaches matches. And today it was the complete opposite. Her her competitiveness in that second set was so good to see. And I love, I love watching her game. You know, it's, it's, it's very smooth and, you know, she will retrieve and defend pretty well and she will loop ball. She, I think she's got a very good tennis, high, very high tennis IQ, but she can also suddenly inject pace onto the ball. And she did that at some very crucial moments in that second set, which she probably should have lost. Potapova, I think, will have regrets about, about not winning that second set. But the fight from Andreva and how different it was to what we saw just a month ago at Roland Garros, I thought was was really noteworthy. And I cannot wait to see her play Madison Keys tomorrow. I I fully intend to be there at uh, 11 a.m. Court Same. Two. That's a great ticket on Court 2 for tomorrow when we will be back with another tennis podcast live from Wimbledon. We have our Wimbledon mascot, Erin. Hello, Erin. We have our mascots, Maisie, Zenya and Darwin. Collective, hello. 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 We have Billie Jean, who's sponsored by Billie Jean King and Alana Kloss. We have our top folks and executive producers, Jamie, Hannah and Drew. And we have shout outs, Matt. We've got Emma Wright from Halifax. Hi, Emma. Hello, Emma. Emma Raducanu. Yes. Mm. Wouldn't it be nice to have Emma Raducanu back in the it mix? It would be. Hopefully she's going to be well soon. It would be. Tennis. Halifax. <laughs> Shouldn't have brought it up. Can't think of any tennis players from Halifax. <laughs> it's Yorkshire, isn't it? Yes, yeah, near Which Bradford, is a right? Near Leeds. Famous sporting, wasn't there? After the London Olympics in 2012, there were all those stats about where Yorkshire would have featured on yes. the medal table, yes. i.e. quite high. Oh, really? Mm. Mm. There we go. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. We've also got Lee McBride from beautiful upper hudson valley of new york oh, wow. oh very lovely how, how are we spelling lee l e i g h l e i g h the oh. elegant way very elegant mm, lovely yeah. hi lee hello lee mm, like brian mcbride fulham legend yeah i knew you were going there <laughs> <laughs> so predictable <laughs> Well, have we got any Lees or McBride no, tennis? No, I was, okay. I was I grateful you went there. I don't even know any Lees L-E-E in tennis. Do you? I can't think of any. 
the good old. <laughs> yes, commentator <laughs> on the world feed. Absolutely. I'm pleased you said that. Nice bloke. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Different spelling. But, you know, Lee, thanks very much for being a friend thanks, of Thanks, Lee. And finally, we've got Kim, who says, My name is Kim, but I'd really like to shout out my cats, Pinky and Pookie. Oh. Oh. oh, Pinky and Pookie. And, and I'm going to end this uh, podcast on a very lovely note, and it's, it's going to make Catherine blush, but Kim says, in a recent family game, we were all asked to name someone we recently took inspiration from, and I chose Catherine because she stands up for what she believes in and she doesn't give up. Love you all. Your pod is great. That's very lovely. I'm sat next to two people that have definitely seen me give up at various points <laughs> in my life. Not and res- resuscitated me from from the floor. Not about anything important. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. And we've got your back, don't you worry. Thank you very much, Kim. I have just one final shout out, and that is to Vicky Spreadbury, who came to see us just before we recorded today. Bought us cakes... Hey. That are already Which dwindling in number. <laughs> I'm not sure how many Matthews eaten. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we've got them over here and not over there. He didn't even say hi to Vicky, and yet he was first <laughs> in on the first in on the blondies. And Vicky also knitted a dress for my new baby niece, Aww. which is genuinely, I think, the most overwhelmingly lovely thing that the human being has ever done. I'm so, I'm bowled over so thank you very much Vicky and to all of our lovely listeners who stop us and take photos with us and oh, god I sounded like a dick saying that <laughs> <laughs> but, but still it's come and see us and say nice things and yeah. just support us we're very we're very very grateful for it um, and thank you for bearing with us tonight through our technical difficulties thank you to everybody that is watching us live, that has been watching us live. If you're enjoying it, technical difficulties aside, please do hit that like and subscribe button. Um, Thank you to everybody that is listening to us as a podcast. If you're enjoying it, leave us an Apple podcast review. Subscribe to the newsletter for stats about how easy Yannick Sinner's draw has been and the latest in King of the 90s, the stat off between resident 90s experts David and Matthew behind the camera who refuses to be in vision uh, what else do I have to promote our social media we're on Twitter we're on Instagram get across it there's all sorts of fun stuff happening there and most importantly do join us again tomorrow at the close of play which we hope will be a little bit earlier but who on, bank earth on it <laughs> knows we will be here tomorrow live on YouTube and on the podcast as normal and we will see you and speak to you then. <laughs>